Volume One, Chapter Five of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith. Volume One, Chapter Five such was the group which at a very late hour in the evening entered the dining-room of mrs molyneux who with her husband and celestina received them in the usual forms lady castlenorth as usual took the lead in conversation having first satisfied herself that mrs molyneux had sent for willoughby and heard her assurances that he would certainly be in town the first moment he possibly could after hearing of the arrival of his noble relations what sort of taste my dear cried her ladyship to mrs molyneux is this apartment fitted up in is this the present style in england i think it extremely ugly this was trenching on matilda in a very tender point taste was her reigning foible and the house had on her recent marriage been fitted up under her directions at an immense expense to have her elegance called so abruptly in question therefore was very far from being pleasant and she answered coldly i'm sorry you dislike it it is i believe the newest style of doing rooms to what does your ladyship object oh to the whole these sort of papers are unclassical and glaring. I don't like the color of your furniture neither. Nor I, interrupted Mrs. Calder. Tis terrible for the eyes. Does not your lordship find it dazzling and inconvenient even by candlelight? She then began to explain the effect of glaring and strong colors on the visual orb, when Lady Castlenorth, who had no intention to throw the conversation into her hands, turned abruptly towards Celestina, of whom she had hitherto taken no notice, and said, looking steadily at her while she addressed Mrs. Molyneux, that, I think, is the young woman whom your late mother said she took out of a convent somewhere in France, is it not? mrs molyneux answering in the affirmative lady castlenorth her eyes still fixed on the object of her inquiry said a eh, i thought i recollected her umph and so mrs willoughby provided for her did she well and is she to live on with you as she did in your mother's time only a few days longer madame said celestina who had borne very impatiently this rude and unfeeling scrutiny i am then going to reside entirely in the country i'm glad of it child replied the lady for i always consider it a misfortune when girls are educated above their fortune and introduced into a style of life they have no pretensions to indeed i gave mrs willoughby my opinion about you repeatedly in your infancy i did not then know her circumstances allowing her in justice to her husband's children to provide so amply for another however though it was a great deal for her to do it is not by any means a fortune to authorize you with prudence to continue to live about town you took i think your christian name from the order of nuns among whom you were reared and your surname i mean the name they gave you it has escaped me my name madame said celestina whose tears were restrained only by indignation is del mornay true i recollect it now i remember i inquired of miss willoughby whether when they gave you that name they had any reason to fancy you any way related to the family of the famous duplicis moray but i think she told me no 
and that you receive that appellation because the superior to whose care you were entrusted had some fanciful partiality to the name to this no answer being given the conversation took another turn but was still engrossed by lady castlenorth while mrs molyneux wearied to death proposed cards and making a table with the noble pair mrs calder and her husband she sat down with herself by miss fitzhaman and endeavoured to enter into conversation with her miss fitzhaman however who never loved her cousin because she had heard her reckoned handsome and who was out of humour to find that willoughby was not yet arrived though there was barely time for him to have come express received all her advances with more than her usual haughty indifference and while she answered in short sentences or mere monosyllables she now examined with looks of dislike the studied but becoming dress of mrs molyneux now with yet more unpleasant expressions glanced with averted head from the corners of her eyes on celestina who without any study at all was infinitely more beautiful these scowling looks of mingled malignity and contempt added to the behaviour of lady castlenorth towards her had by this time rendered the room so disagreeable to her that she left it as soon as she could a loud rap at the door however soon after announced the arrival of other visitors and some ladies coming in who had finished their circle of visits for that evening mrs milanot as tired of the daughter's silence as she had before been of the mother's loquility proposed a table at vin un which celestina was immediately desired to join the party was hardly placed at it before mr molyneux was informed by his gentleman that mr willoughby was below and asked to speak to him desire him to come up replied he without any seeming consciousness of the formidable nature of the interview he was to go through he is in boots sir replied the servant and desired me to say that he is going immediately to his lodgings oh but we shall not let him go said molyneux do mrs molyneux continued he addressing himself to his wife do go down and bring up this brother of yours mrs molyneux rose and left the room lady castlenorth still appearing to attend to her game turned her fiercely questioning eyes first on her daughter who might have blushed if her complexion had been calculated to shrew the suffusion of blood and then unluckily they were attracted by the more unequivocal and deep rose colour which for a moment took possession of the face of celestina who sat next to her there was no time to comment on this appearance before it was heightened by the entrance of willoughby who was immediately led by his sister to lord castlenorth then to her ladyship and at length to miss fitzhaman he paid his compliments to all with his usual graceful manners but not without an impression of pain and embarrassment in his countenance which he seemed vainly trying to shake off he had yet distinguished nobody in the room but those who whom he had been speaking but on recovering from the low bow he had made to miss fitzhaman he saw celestina and staring he said in a hurrying way miss de moray i thought you had left my sister i hope i see you well celestina answered only by a curtsey and willoughby turning away towards mrs molyneux told her that he was a good deal fatigued and must beg her to excuse him for the rest of the evening but that he would be with her the following morning to breakfast your lordship added he turning to the uncle will perhaps allow me to pay my respects to you 
and Lady Castlenorth in the course of the morning. Then, without waiting for the reply, which his lordship was in great form waiting to give him, he hurried out of the room, and the card-tables very soon afterwards broke up. The Willoughby was very much altered since Miss Fitzhaman had last seen him, the change appeared greatly in his favour. His undress, and the agitation he was apparently in, which she inputted to the very effect of her charms, combined to make him appear more interesting both to the mother and the daughter, and as they went home Lord Castlenorth, who grew every day fonder of the proposed marriage, spoke much in praise of his nephew's filigree and manner. He has a great deal, said he, of the family counterance. He strikes me, indeed, he always did from a boy, as resembling greatly the picture painted on board of William, son of Robert Fritz Heyman, sent shall to Henry the Second, who obtained the grants of this estate in Gloucestershire. His arms were azure, a lion rampant, gardened, or the original bearing of the family. You see it so in the great window of the hall at Castle North. The next is that of his wife, party per pale, two griffins countersailant, sable, langed gulls. This is my first quarter for the name Bigot, a daughter of which house. This William, son of Robert, married. Lord Castleneth was now got on his favourite topic, and in the numberless quarterings of his present bearing he quite forgot the merits of his nephew, and was busied among wyverns and boars, pearls, salt piers, fesses, and bent dexters, till they arrived at their own house. The imaginations, however, of the rest of the the company, finding nothing to arrest them in a detail so often repeated, had all left them to settle his chevrons and chevronelles his own way. Even the attentive and complacent Mrs. Calder was considering whether a lady in the company they had left, who had related her complaints to her, was in a right course of medicine. Lady Castlenorth was laying up a little magazine of literature, which she intended to open on Willoughby the next day, and her daughter was contemplating in her mind's eye the handsome person of Willoughby, the figure they should make at court, and the triumph there would be when, without degrading herself by an unequal alliance in point of family, she should notwithstanding carry to her husband so splendid a fortune and titles so ancient and illustrious end of volume one chapter five recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c volume one chapter six of celestina this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith. Volume 1, Chapter 6. The party the noble visitors had left were very differently employed. Mrs. Molyneux, almost always accustomed to be heard with attention, and submitted to with deference as a beauty and a woman of exquisite taste, was piqued and offended by the air of superior intelligence assumed by Lady Castlenorth, who treated her like a child that knew nothing. Miss Fitzhaman, too, had not expressed any admiration at her dress and figure but had viewed her with supercilious silence, while Mrs. Calder, from knowing her to be a young married woman, had with more 
curiosity than elegance inquired whether she was likely to give the Molyneux family the air so much desired by the older part of it a question which extremely disgusted her lord castlenorth who had complimented her upon her person particularly on her long chinese eyes and the form of her face which he said was extremely like that of gertrude fitz hyman some maid of honour to catherine of aragon and afterwards countess of powis was she declared to mr molyneux the only tolerable creature of the party my uncle said she as soon as they were alone my uncle is a reasonable being but for the rest did you ever see a plainer woman than miss fitzhaman her clothes might be french but i am sure she looks absolutely dutch in them it's really a misfortune at her time of life to be so large molyneux carelessly answered you see she is sensible of the misfortune by her endeavours to conceal it but tis more witty than wise i think to find fault with her willoughby can see i suppose as well as you can and i don't think it's very polite in you to give him your authority for disliking her let him marry her and then hate and abuse her as much as you will oh replied the lady i shall always detest her and so dare say will he interrupt molyneux but let them be once married and all that is very immaterial to you it is by no means so that your brother cannot till he does marry pay the second five thousand pounds of your fortune unless he sells the withcombe estate which indeed the mortgage e is as far as i can learn very impatient to take possession of with this charge upon it which he will immediately pay off you see that willoughby has no choice matrimony or the dismembering his estates and pray never put it into his head to hesitate this affectionate brother-in-law then went to his own dressing-room and mrs molyneux taking a candle surveying herself in the great glass and wondering how it was possible such a figure and face could fail to attract universal ad admiration from all ages and sexes retired to her bed the contemplations of poor Celestina, who had left them the moment the company dispersed, were much more painful. The sight of Willoughby, his surprise, and, as she thought, his displeasure at finding her still there, were as poisoned arrows in her breast. But the pride of consciousness worth, aided by her disinterested affection for him, enabled her though not to heal, yet to endure without weak complainings the exquisite pain they inflicted, and to give her courage immediately to execute the design she had long formed of withdrawing herself from his sight for ever. It was now impossible for her to set out the next day, but that immediately following it she fixed for her departure and after a night in which she enjoyed very little repose she arose early in order to make the immediate preparations for her journey which she determined in order to save expense to make the esther stage as she was desirous of giving as little trouble as possible to mr molyneux's servants who were all people of great consequence and would any of them have thought such a commission degrading she determined to go herself into the city where places were to be taken it was yet so early when she went down to execute this intention that only the housemaid was stirring and the windows of the parlour only were opened there celestina sat while the maid went into the kitchen to get her a glass of milk and water which she had asked for 
and while she yet trifled with it being indeed afraid to venture into the streets till she saw more people in them she heard the servant who was at the door dusting the hall and steps speak to somebody who entered and the instant afterwards milby came into the room where she was she arose trembling and amazed from her seat mr moray said he so early prepared to go out celestina answered yes and sat down again he laid down his hat on the sideboard and if he knew not what to say went to the window celestina sat motionless and willoughby after standing there a moment seemed ashamed of his silence yet afraid to speak he traversed the room mended the fire and complaining of the cold at length ventured to inquire of celestina what induced her to venture out at so early an hour of so unpleasant a morning she replied calmly for she had by this time regained her composure that she had business in the city business in the city cried willoughby and at this time of day ah celestina there was a time when you would not thus have answered my inquiry he was going on when celestina interrupted him there was indeed said she with a deep sigh a time when you would not have made it not have made it answered he was i not then ever interested in all that concerned you and was any action of yours indifferent to me he faltered and stopped i was once simple enough to think so indeed said celestina and in those days of fortunate illusion you certainly would have made no such inquiry as the present because i should then have done nothing of which you would not have known the motive nor have taken any measure without the concurrence of my brother and my friend but as you told me yourself would i forget it that it was no longer in your power to retain these characters towards me i am learning to forget that i ever was so happy as to fancy that no change in my situation especially a change for the worse could rob me of that regard so valuable always so particularly valuable now gracious heaven cried willoughby entirely thrown off guard by her words and manner how i have acted what i have said to deserve this reproach from you celestina when we parted last she again interrupted him did we part like friends like brother and sister no reported he hastily but i tore myself from you like a man who sacrifices to the performance of a fatal promise his own happiness and who is the victim of a family pride and family necessity this sentence was decisive his resolution forsook him at once and his long stifled affection burst through all the restraints he determined to lay on it o oh, celestina continued he you whom i loved before i knew what it was to love you whom i now adore with a passion too strong for my reason do not do not i beseech you aggravate my sufferings i promised to my mother and you know how well she deserved to be obeyed i promised to unite myself with her niece i promised to extirpate from my heart an inclination that even then i could not conceal rash and ridiculous promise no celestina it is impossible for me to cease loving you all my behavior which you have thought cold and unfriendly was a part i was acting in opposition to my real affections i can sustain no longer i cannot bear that you should think of me with indifference and yet oh my mother what a cruel task have you imposed on me celestina pity me i am more wretched than you can imagine 
his agitation now became too violent he seized the hand of celestina and feverently kissed it while her own sensations were such as no language can describe that willoughby loved her that what she had considered as indifference was owing to the struggle between his duty and his tenderness was transport such as obliterated every other sentiment but this delirium lasted but a moment her reason her genuine affection for him told her that to indulge this tenderness was injurious to him and she determined to show that she could sacrifice herself to his advantage and that contented with her brotherly attachment she could resign him to the fortune of miss fitzhaman the terms however in which she declared this the softness of her voice and the eyes filled with tears were little calculated to reconcile willoughby to the resolution which after a long dialogue she urged him to adopt she assured him that whatever might be her own fate she should never forgive herself were she to be the means of his breaking a promise so solemnly given and given at such a time to her dear deceased benefactress no my brother said she she is dead but my obligations to her can never be annihilated and what would become of me were i ever to feel myself reproached for ingratitude to her memory were i to destroy the fabric which she had raised for the happiness of her beloved son and to fancy that the spirit of my more than mother which i now often invocate with conscious pleasure should instead of beholding her celestina with complacency not unsuited to her present state of happiness see her degraded into a selfish and unworthy being who repays her benefits with the blackest ingratitude willoughby whose love once suffered to obtain the advantage now acquired more power every moment combated these objections with a very dangerous eloquence telling celestina that he had determined the evening before on a sight of miss fitzhaman who was insupportable to him to put an end to the negotiation and say plainly to his uncle that it was impossible for him to fulfil an engagement in which his heart never had any share celestina represented to him the situation of his fortune the absolute necessity there was for his marrying one who could repair its deficiency and restore him to the splendid affluence of his ancestors but for this he talked of economy and simplicity by which when they lived entirely at alvanstone he should be able to repair everything then for a moment indulging his vivid imagination in painting the happiness they should enjoy there together images of felicity which reflected in stronger colours those which celestina had a thousand times formed though knowing they could never be realised he thought suddenly of the fatal promise he had given to his mother and his heart seemed to shrink from the idea of breaking it to obtain even the highest human happiness which under such circumstances he felt would be dashed with gall he obtained however from celestina but not without difficulty a promise that she would lay aside her intentions of going into the city that morning to prepare for her journey of which he would not hear and she prevailed upon him to wait on lord castlenorth as he had assured the family he would do though wherefore should i do it said he unless to put an end at once and for ever to all thoughts of this odious marriage you ought surely replied celestina to wait on the brother of your mother though no such connection 
had been thought of and no dislike which you may have conceived to miss fitzhaman as your wife should induce you to forget what you owe to your uncle by arguments thus reasonable celestina while she prevailed on willoughby to do what was he was forced to own proper would have riveted his chains if indeed they had not already been immovable the noble candor and disinterested generosity of her soul gave tenfold force to the charms of her person which since he had last seen her willoughby thought greatly improved and the tenderness of her manner the certainty of her affection for him which she tried to conceal with more kindness than success had altogether such an effect on him that nothing but the fatal promise which lay so heavy on his heart could have prevented his marrying her immediately in despite of every consideration of prudence or family engagement end of volume one chapter six recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Volume One, Chapter Seven of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith. Volume One, Chapter Seven while celestina remained with willoughby the very tumult and agitation of her heart had sustained her courage and like a fever that lends momentarily strength to the patient it is destroying this disorder of her spirits had supported her against the flood of tenderness that overwhelmed her as soon as she was alone a conflict that began between her affliction for him and her duty and gratitude towards the memory of his mother which was almost too severe to be endured but however soft in her heart her reason was equal to the task of checking a dangerous or guilty indulgence of that sensibility and after long arguing with herself she found she loved willoughby better than everything but his honour and his repose the first and to probably the second she saw too plainly that he must forfeit by yielding to an affliction which circumstanced as he was would perhaps be as fatal to both as certainly was to his pecuniary interest she had heard mr molyneux say who had his reasons for repeating it before her that nothing but his marrying a woman as opulent as miss fitzhaman could prevent his selling the greater part of his estates and in that case added he i don't see how he can avoid disposing of alveston too for the income he will then have to think of keeping up such a place as that will be quite insanity celestina knew that no blow could fall so heavy on the heart of willoughby as the cruel necessity of selling this his paternal seat and though she was flattered and delighted when he had just before declared to her that to obtain her every deprivation would be easy she knew while she now more coolly reflected on it his local attachment to be strong that it was very probable his love would soon yield to the regret which would arise from their sacrifice what would become of me said she as she meditated on this matter were i to be the wife of willoughby and to see him unhappy that i was so he would have broken his faith to his mother he who has always been taught to hold the slightest promise sacred he would see his estate dismembered even alveston the place he so loves would pass into the hands of strangers and it would be 
to me he would owe his indigence and his unhappiness how dare i suppose that my affection warm and sincere as it is could make him any amends for all those mortifications oh let me not suppose it nor even think of risking it i can bear to quit him now i believe i can but how should i endure to find myself the source of repentance to him how should i ever survive seeing him decidedly unhappy with the consciousness that he owed his being so to his partiality for me these reflections and above all the obligation by which he had bound himself to obey the last injunctions of his mother determined celestina as to the conduct she ought to adopt and having once seen it by the light lent by integrity and disinterested love to her strong and excellent understanding she hastened to execute it and certainly that he was engaged for the rest of the morning she had no sooner breakfasted than she told mrs molyneux that she was going to make some purchases for which she had occasion before she left london and getting into a hackery coach was driven into the city where she secured a place in the exeter stage which was to leave london at a very early hour the next day she returned to the house of mrs molyneux about twelve o'clock and then learned that she and her husband were engaged to dine at lord castlenoff's where a very large party were to assemble in the card which lady castlenorth had sent to invite them no mention was made of celestina nor was any separate card sent to her it is mere forgetfulness i fancy said mrs molyneux as she mentioned it to her you will go however as the ceremony of an invitation is not very material pardon me replied celestina it appears to me of so much consequence in the present case that i certainly shall not go without it i am indeed very glad to be excused and i am sure you will not urge me to violate etiquette in a matter which to forbear doing it is so particularly desirable mrs molyneux very solicitous about the contents of certain bandboxes with which her woman entered at that moment forbore to press her further and celestina desiring her to let her know when she was dressed that she might see her before she went retired to her own room leaving her friend to the pleasing and important occupation of the toilet in which half what is now called mourning was usually passed by matilda celestina had promised willoughby to give up for that day her intention of fixing her journey but this promise she thought herself well justified in breaking the entertainment at lord castlenoff's was given on his account of course he would be engaged the whole day and since she must go she desired nothing so much as to be spared the fruitless pain of a farther discussion of the subject and the misery which she was not sure her resolution would support of bidding him a last farewell a little after five however after she had undergone the form of sitting down alone to table where she eat nothing and had then retired to her own room mrs willoughby's woman came to say that her mistress was dressed celestina had once determined to tell mrs molyneux how soon she meant to quit her and to have taken leave of her but on reflection she thought her doing so might betray her resolution to willoughby from whom it was necessary to conceal it till it was actually executed she therefore intended to leave a letter of thanks and to take leave of mrs molyneux as if it was only till the next day but when the moment approached in which she was in reality to bid adieu perhaps for ever to the friend and companion of her infancy 
to the daughter of her beloved friend to the sister of willoughby her heart sunk within her and hardly had she the strength to go to the door of mrs molyneux's dressing-room on opening which she saw her friend standing before the glass putting the last finish to her very elegant dress while with her eyes fixed on her own figure she was arguing with more than her usual warmth with some person who sat beside her and who celestina presently discovered to be willoughby himself in boots and his hair out of powder his countenance was pale and dejected and while his sister talked to him he leaned with one arm on another chair and seemed rather musing than attending i'm glad you are come said mrs molyneux to celestina as she entered for here is george behaving quite absurdly he will not go he says to lord castlenorse though the dinner is made on purpose for him do celestina he minds your opinion always more than mine do try to make him understand how very observe and oddly he acts i have no talents celestina would have said but the words died away on her lips and before she could collect courage to finish the sentence molyneux who was now ready came in and seeing willoughby unprepared to go expressed his surprise in terms which were warmer than willoughby could hear with perfect command of temper surely sir said he i am my own master i am not disposed to go and i will not go and what am i to say cried mrs molyneux to lady castlenorth to my uncle and to my cousin just what you pleased replied he molyneux finding by the tone in which his brother-in-law spoke that he would not be dictated to now called his wife out of the room and willoughby and celestina were left alone it was now that all her fortitude and strength of mind were necessary her duty evidently was to persuade willoughby to accompany his sister and to complete a marriage which his mother had when dying enjoined a marriage so necessary to the acquisition of all that the world calls happiness in life and on which depended the continuance of the family estate in his possession but her heart refused to assent to what her reason pointed out as the conduct she ought to pursue and the affection he now so evidently had for her adding to the strength of her long attachment to him she found it impossible to urge his quitting her for ever though she thought she had yet courage enough to tear herself from him if she heard not his complaints nor witness his agonies while she combated her own i cannot i will not go to those people said willoughby after short silence why should i since to marry miss fitzhaman would be the height of cruelty to her since i am incapable of dissimulation since in short celestina i feel it to be impossible for me to live with her to live without you and i have determined to declare myself in writing to that effect celestina whom this speech was not calculated to calm answered trembling indeed i think you wrong mr willoughby as your uncle as your mother's brother lord castlenorth has undoubtedly a claim to this mark of respect it is not probably expected to be anything more than a visit of form and surely you ought not rudely and without reason to decline it if it were indeed meant only as a visit of ceremony said he it is in your power however interrupted celestina to appear to consider it so your not going must seem very extraordinary your going certainly leads to no consequence if you think so replied willoughby if you think i ought to go but why did they not ask you why 
should they ask me answered she i'm almost unknown to lady castlenorth and in the little time i ever did see her i appeared to be no favourite believe me so far from being displeased i am rejoiced at the omission insolent odious woman cried willoughby if anything could add to my dislike of her and her daughter it would be the supercilious airs they gave themselves towards you in the short moment i saw them here but my celestina shall never be exposed to their insulting scorn and if i myself this time undergo the punishment of keeping up the hateful farce which i have so unhappily been engaged in it shall be with a determination to put an end to it at this moment mr and mrs molyneux entered the room and celestina wishing them all an agreeable day left it having sustained with some difficulty the various emotions which were contending in her bosom willoughby soon after left the house to dress at his own lodgings which were in the neighbourhood and having promised to join his brother and sister at dinner they soon after departed themselves much better satisfied with him than they were before his short conversation with celestina end of volume one chapter seven recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c volume one chapter eight of celestina this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c celestina by charlotte turner smith volume one chapter eight celestina though more unwilling than ever to go had prescribed to herself in her cooler moments a line of conduct from which feeling it her duty to adhere to it she now determined not to depart in arguing with herself on its propriety and strengthening her faltering resolution she passed the night at four o'clock the servant who was commissioned to awaken her came to her door she arose and dressed herself by candlelight the morning was cold and dark every object appeared dreary and forlorn she hurried on her clothes however and endeavoured to drive away every recollection that might enfeeble her spirits too much but as she passed the door of the drawing-room she remembered that it was there she had seen willoughby perhaps for the last time and almost involuntarily she went in and by the light of her solitary candle contemplated a whole length picture of him which had just been finished for his sister the likeness was so strong by the wavering and uncertain light that fell upon it she almost fancied he was about to speak to her she started at the idea and feeling a fort of chilly terror at the silence and obscurity of everything around her she turned away and hastened to the servant who had prepared her tea in the parlour she had however hardly time to drink it before the hackney coach which had been ordered the night before was at the door and having seen what little baggage she had not before sent put into it she stepped in herself and was soon a distance from the residence of mrs molyneux from the friend of her early years and was launched alone and unprotected into a world of which she had yet seen nothing but through the favourable medium lent by affluence and prosperity to those who from thence contemplate difficulties they are never likely to encounter and calamities they probably never can participate that a young woman who might still have enjoyed those indulgences should renounce them at an age 
when they have so many charms that celestina who had been educated with so much delicacy and accustomed since her first recollection to every indulgence should thus voluntarily enter on a life of comparative hardship and deprivation may appear improbable but when it is added that she quitted the man to whom she had so long been fondly attached and leaving him to her fortunate rival devoted herself to a life of solitude and regret such an effort of heroism in a woman not yet quite nineteen might be classed among impossibilities were it related of any other than celestina but her character was an uncommon one though she had always been told by mrs willoughby that her birth was very uncertain and that nothing was known of it but that it was disgraceful to her parents since they had taken such pains to conceal it she felt within herself a conscientious of hereditary worth an innate pride which would never suffer her to believe herself descended from mean and unworthy persons her open and commanding countenance where sat dignity mingled with sweetness her nymph flight and graceful form which might have rivalled the models of grecian art were advantages of which though she was not vain of them she could not be insensible and if she had any foible a perfect character it has been said must not be represented because it cannot exist if she had any foible it was carrying a little too far though she carefully concealed it that sort of pride which seemed born with her and which after all that has been said against it is often especially in a young and beautiful woman a fortunate defect the circumstances of her birth had seldom been touched upon in the family for it was a topic which could not be but painful to her but if ever anything relating to it had been accidentally introduced when mrs willoughby was conversing with her three children as she often termed willoughby matilda and celestina willoughby would say laughingly that it was impossible she could be born of french parents her mother had been sometimes half angry at this assertion in which however he usually persisted asserting with prejudice that she declared to be entirely english that no native of the south of france ever had a complexion or a form like hers after she grew up though these perfections became more eminent willoughby never appeared to notice them with the improvement of her form her mind kept pace and as it acquired every day more strength she gradually became more sensible of her obligation to her benefactress but while she indulged her gratitude towards the friend on whom she depended she felt that she was not born to be dependent this elevation of spirit now supported her and the consciousness she was acting right blunted for a while the poignancy of that pain which she too sensibly felt in tearing herself from willoughby obliged to act for herself having no breast on which she could with propriety lean her naturally exalted soul acquired new firmness before which trifling inconveniences disappeared and with an heart occupied by the beloved image of willoughby and the sacrifice she was making for him she hardly remembered that she had never in her life been in a stage-coach before till she found herself seated in one under the dark gateway of an inn in the city at five o'clock in a dreary winter morning two female passengers had already taken their places one of whom expressed great anxiety for a number of hat-boxes and caravan trunks 
which the people belonging to the inn were placing in different parts of the coach, while the lady particularly recommended to their care one box, which she assured them contained her new laylock bonnet, an article for the safety of which she was so solicitous that she would have taken the great machine in which it was contained into the coach, had it not been opposed by the coachman, and presently after by a man who had been drinking with him, and who now preparing to enter the coach, protested vehemently against this whim of his sister Mary's. "'Who do you think will be scruffed and crammed up?' cried he, with your confounded trumpetry. "'No, no such thing.' Here, Danielle, prithee take and stow it somewhere or another. It shall not enter the couch, I be sworn. The man then placed himself by the side of the other female passenger, opposite Celestina, and appeared to be anxious for his own ease, and his sister was for the safety of her wardrobe. The coach moved on, but it was still quite dark, and silence prevailed for the first four or five miles interrupted only by some fretful expressions from the lady of the bandboxes at the inconveniences to which people were subjected by going in stage coaches and some exclamations against the unfortunate dampness of the morning which she declared would certainly penetrate the covering and entirely spoil her laylock bonnet which she said cost her three guineas the more fool you cried the brother who was of a character celestina had never had an opportunity of seeing before that of a country tradesman affecting to be a wit and a buck the more fool you sister mary what do you think a three guinea bonnet will make you look three years younger no no take my word for it your flounces and fringes and fur barrels serve for no purpose at all but to shrew your wrinkles wrinkles repeated the lady disdainfully what do you mean john jewin i declare you are so rude and disagreeable i always repent travelling with you i wish you would find another subject egad answered jewin i cannot have a worse than your wrinkles that's true enough and upon my soul added he, looking confidently in the face of Celestina, and then in that of the other female passenger, who, though pale and thin, was very young and very pretty. Here is two better subjects, one aside of me and the other opposite. No, no, sister of mine, now day breaks a little, and let a body see how the land lays you'll hear no more about your wrinkles for as hamlet says let me see a eh? here's that metal that's more attractive a eh, miss celestina to whom this hey miss was addressed who had till now been very little aware of the species of rudeness and impertinence to which her mode of travelling might subject her was shocked and alarmed at this address from a person who had he seen her a few days before would have approached her with awe and spoken to her with dissidence she remained silent however casting a look on the man sufficiently expressive of the contempt she felt for him but he was not of a humour to be easily daunted or repulsed and without seeming to understand her began with purse-proud pertness to relate as if it was a narrative which all the world should be informed of that he was a grocer and chandler at exeter in a very flourishing trade and in partnership with a gentleman who had married one of his sisters and this laylock bonnet lady continued he is my elder sister who has been visiting this half year and better an old aunt of ours at camberwell she is an old maid herself but devilish rich and from a sort of fellow feeling you know 
she intends to make our Mary here her heir. The old girl must hop the perch soon, or all her money won't get her dear niece a husband, it's my opinion, unless May be an Irishman or a strolling player. This second attack on herself, and her visible admiration of Celestina's beauty, completed the ill-humour of his sister, who with a look where anger and scorn contented for preeminence remained silently swelling, while the factitious traitor again addressed himself to Celestina. What, do you never make talking? Come, since now you have a history of me, let's hear a little who you are and where you are bound to. Sir, replied Celestina, it is impossible that either can be of any consequence to you. How are you sure of that? cried Mr. Jedwin, with a loud laugh. Now I think nothing is more likely than that we may be better acquainted. Tis nothing now, I believe, for a young man of spirit, as well as the world I am, to take a fancy to a pretty woman. A fancy? exclaimed Miss Mary Jewin, with great acrimony. A fancy? Jack Jewin, I am amazed at you. And why amazed, my ancient spinster? retorted he. What the devil? I am my own master, I hope. To be sure you are some fifteen or twenty years older than me, but what of that? So much the worse for you. I hope I ain't to be governed by a duenna. What a plague! Mayn't I talk to a handsome girl? I wonder without you putting your squinny gut opinion. If you intend to insult me, answered the lady, trying to hide under the appearance of a calm contempt her great disposition to cry, if you intend to insult me, I am sure I heartily wish I had got the better of my fears and travelled alone in a post chay for no rudeness as I might have met on the road could be worse than yours. That's your gratitude now, cried Jedwin, for my coming up clear from Exeter to fetch you at a time when I had no business in London, nor should a had for the six weeks that your thanks for my kindness and for listening to your nonsensical fears and frights rude to you o lord as if any mortal man who has eyes would ever look at you twice no mary make yourself easy that weazen winterly visage of yours is faithguard enough if you were to travel from here to jericho he then began to mimic his sister and enlarge the terrors to which she was he said perpetually subject lest some sad daring rake of a man should carry her away, and had he been less gross and disgusting, Celestina would hardly have forborne a smile at some part of the ludicrous representation he gave of this apprehensive delicacy and trembling nicety for which she could not, in the personal attractions of Miss Jedwin, find any reasonable grounds for she was very tall, very thin, and very yellow. Her long, scraggly neck appeared hardly adequate to the support of a head, where art had so redundantly been called in aid of nature, that it seemed to abound in shining black hair, nicely curled, without powder, which was suffered to wanton over her forehead and flow down her back, while a little white beaver hat perched on one side was meant to give her countenance that bewitching archness which she had observed that mode of headdress to bestow on young and lovely mr jedwin having exhausted all his immediate stock of wit on his sister now left her to digest the indignation he had raised and applied himself again to celestina having no idea that anything but money bestowed consequence, and having lived the greater part of his time among those who had less of it 
than himself he had never been accustomed to allow any superiority nor could he comprehend how a young woman so humbly situated in life as to travel in a stage-coach could help being charmed into liking by his wit and awed into complacence by his importance on such a man the native dignity of celestina failed totally of its usual effect he became more and more troublesome for he was piqued but not repressed by the coldness and even contempt of her manner he told her among much other impertinence that all her shyness should not hinder him from finding out who she was and then with yet more offensive familiarity addressed himself to the other young woman who he thought belonged to her and who heard his conversation with terror and dislike as great as that of celestina his behavior at length became insupportingly uneasy to her celestina when the coach reached the village where they were to breakfast determined not to subject herself to it any longer she therefore ordered her tea to be carried into another room and a post-chaise to be ready as soon as she had drank it as she sat at her breakfast she saw the young woman whose countenance had greatly interested her walk to the window slowly and dejectedly one hand held to her forehead and a handkerchief in the other ever ready to assist the unhappy the generous heart of celestina was touched with a compassion towards the forlorn stranger she is as young as i am said she and perhaps even more unfortunate why should i not take her with me if she is as i suppose travelling the same road why should i leave her exposed to the insults of this odysseus man which humble as her fortune seems to be she ill knows how to bear i may at least though i cannot otherwise assist her save her from passing the remainder of the journey improperly and unpleasantly celestina then rang the bell and directing her fellow-traveller to be called desired her not only to partake of her breakfast but to accompany her the rest of the way in a post-chaise which she had ordered to escape from mr jedwin the young person notwithstanding the kindness of celestina's address still continued standing and with a faint blush said you are very good madame but though we happen to be in the same coach i am sure i ought not to put myself on a footing with you i am only a servant travelling into the country to my friends to recover my health and it would be very wrong in me to intrude on a lady like you celestina won by this humble simplicity soon reassured her new acquaintance and soon after jessie woodburn which was her name followed celestina to the chaise where having paid the coach in london she now had directed her box to be placed mr jedwin left the hot rolls and chocolate with which he was regaling himself to remonstrate at the chaise door against this succession celestina without giving him any answer drew up the glasses the moment she was seated which gave jedwin an opportunity to say to the postilion who was not yet on horseback that if he would in the course of a fortnight find out who the lady was and whither she went he would make up the half-crown he then gave him a half-guinea the boy readily promised to execute to the best of his power so lucrative a commission and celestina and her companion were soon at a distance and proceeded on their journey much pleased with the exchange they had made of a conveyance end of volume one chapter seven recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c volume one 
Chapter Nine of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith, Volume One, Chapter Nine. Celestina, having by her easy and gentle manners conquered part of the extreme diffidence of her companion, began to question her about her situation in life, and as she had one of those faces and one of those voices which win every heart where any spark of feeling is found, Jessie soon found herself enough at ease and even flattered by the interest she seemed to take in her fate, as to acquire courage to relate the following narrative. I must go back a great way, madame, since you command me to tell you all I know of myself, even as far as my grandfather, who is, is one of the richest farmers in our part of Devonshire, using his own land, as all his family I have heard have done before him for a great many years. He married a clergyman's daughter, who had been educated very well, greatly indeed above the sort of life she was to lead as a farmer's wife. But she was very pretty. Her father left her unprovided for, and so she married perhaps more for money than love. My mother was the only child they ever had, and my grandmother, though her own education had only served to make her unhappy, would fain have had her daughter brought up as she had been herself. But her husband, of a very hard and obstinate temper, and repenting perhaps of having married a wife too fine for him, was so far from allowing her to have any education that he went to the other extreme, insisting that his girl should do as his mother did thirty or forty years before, and not only be taught to understand all the business of the farm, but to live as he did himself, as he obliged his wife to do, the same as farming men. The consequence of this difference of opinion was fatal to my poor mother. One of her parents took every opportunity of giving her notions about herself, which very naturally she easily took, and the other seemed to delight in humbling and degrading her. When she was about eighteen she lost her mother, and then was forced to submit to the harsh and unnecessary confinement imposed upon her by her father, from whom she endeavoured to conceal her passion for reading, which only gained strength by this unreasonable restraint. Home was very uneasy to her, but she could hardly ever leave it but by stealth. As she was likely to have a very good fortune, she had numerous suitors, but my grandfather would suffer none of them to see her, designing to marry her to a relation of his own almost as old as himself, to whom she had an invincible aversion, which, through the timidity of her nature, she dared not declare. A neighboring farmer, with whom my grandfather had for many years been at variance, and with whom he had two or three lawsuits, had two sons, both brought up to his own business. The eldest was married and had a family, but the other had been spoiled by his mother, and the notice taken of him by the neighboring gentleman on account of his skill in field sports, he had indeed always been rather fonder of being with them at cricket matches and races than minding his farm. He found means to introduce himself to my mother, though he had been positively refused by my grandfather. He won her affections, and after several private meetings she agreed to go off with him, the consequence of which was her having the door of her paternal house shut against her for ever. For a little time after this marriage my mother was received at the house of her father-in-law, 
but on his death it became the right of the eldest son who had a number of children and my father's family were all irritated and disappointed by the obstinate resentment of my grandfather towards his daughter they soon behaved with such unkindness towards her that she prevailed on my father to quit them and take a little farm of his own which he with difficulty borrowed money enough to stock for he had long since paid away in discharge of old debts all the money left him by his father he had been so long used to an idle or rather gay life that he could not now accustom himself to the labor requisite on so small a farm my mother however by incessant attention remedied for some years this deficiency on his part and though nothing was laid by they contrived to live my mother making from time to time attempts to obtain her father's pardon though she received nothing but cruel and positive refusals either to see her or her children or to give them the least assistance this hardness of heart which should have excited pity only made my father treat my mo poor mother with more harshness too a young man of fortune in the neighborhood just then coming of age was often at his seat near our little farm and took such a fancy to my father that he was always at his house living as he lived and associating with gentlemen from london and women they brought down with them he never came home but in such a terrible humor that i and my sister who were then about ten and nine years old used to be terrified to death yet when he was gone as he sometimes was for weeks together my mother lamented his absence and the loss of his affection much more than the fatigue poverty and sorrow to which his conduct exposed us all present anxiety and the fear of leaving me and my sister to a fate of deplorable as her own together with the incessant toil attending the care of a farm wholly neglected by her husband gradually destroyed her constitution till at last madame her heart was quite broken when she found she had only a few hours to live she entreated the clergyman of the parish to go to her father and beg if he would not see her that he would only send her his forgiveness for she could not die in peace without it even that he had the cruelty to refuse i lost my dear mother madame and my sister who was always of weak constitution followed her soon afterwards to the grave ah how often have i wished that i had died too troubles now multiplied around us my father's great friend had by this time so completely ruined himself that everything was seized and he left the country my father having no longer a house to be at was forced to live at home but it was only for a little while for during my mother's illness everything had been neglected and we could not pay our rent so the landlord seized our cattle were sold and we were turned out of the farm and went to a miserable cottage in the next village where as my father was so unused to work we subsisted for a while on the reluctant charity of my uncle whose daughters were always reproaching me with taking their bread from them believe me madame i did all i could to earn it for my father and myself but what could hands so feeble as mine do towards supporting us both i made an attempt to see my grandfather and to implore his pity and protection towards one who had never offended him but he ordered me to be driven from his door and never again suffered to appear there orders which those he had about him were ready enough to execute i returned home quite disheartened indeed but still endeavouring to the utmost of my power to procure a support by my labour for my father and myself i even went out to work in the fields but all i could earn was so insufficient 
that we often wanted necessary food at least i have often wanted it but my father had made an acquaintance with a widow woman in the next village who was said to be worth forty or fifty pounds she was young too and not ugly and in less than a year after my dear mother's death he married her and we removed to her house the extremes of poverty i had before known bitter as i thought them were comparatively happiness to what i now endured i became the servant of my mother-in-law only without wages she soon brought my father an increase of family to them then i was nurse and very soon had neither sleep by night or respite by day i thought it my duty to bear everything for my father without murmuring but as my fatigue and sufferings increased my dejection increased too i was sometimes through mere despondence unable to fulfil my heavy tasks in which if i failed in the slightest decree i was insulted with opprobrious language and told to go to my rich grandfather alas my rich grandfather continued inexorable but home was so dreadful that i determined to go to service being near twenty and able i thought to undertake any place that could be offered me for a harder than i now filled it was impossible to meet with i applied to a relation i had in exeter who after some inquiries procured me a place in the family of an attorney in london who was willing to dispense with my want of experience in favour of my being a country servant thither therefore i went and entered as cheerfully as i could on a new mode of life endeavouring to forget i ever had any expectations of better the dark damp places where the servants of persons in the middling ranks of life live in the city appeared very dreadful to me and it was my business after a day of fatiguing work to sit up for my master or the clerks who were often out very late my mistress too was a very fine lady and kept a great deal of company and it was part of my employment to wait on her own maid who was also a sort of housekeeper and much more difficult to be pleased than the lady herself she took care indeed that i should never want business but determined as i was never again to be a brethren to my father i went through the duties of my place heavy as they were with courage and steadiness so that even this second mistress however unwilling to be pleased could not find fault with me among a great number of clerks that my master kept there was one who was employed merely to copy and was not admitted among the rest though he looked i am sure more like a gentleman than any of them he did not lodge in the house but came every morning early to his work and sat at it poor young man till five or six o'clock at night when he dined with us servants after the family and other clerks had done often indeed instead of eating he would sigh all dinner time as if his heart would break and i could not help fancying that he had been used to live quite in other company though he never seemed above ours he was always very obliging though he was very melancholy it happened once that my master had some extraordinary business to do that required great haste it was some papers that were to be sent to india and mr cathcart the young man i had been speaking of hearing my master say how afraid he was he should not get ready offered to work all day on sunday when none of the rest of the clerks would have stayed from their pleasure on any account my master was pleased with his willingness to oblige and he sat down to his task nobody was in the house but him and me for it was the custom of my master and mistress to dine in the country on a sunday with my mistress's mother at edmonton and all the gentlemen in the office went different ways 
the footman attended my mistress and mrs gillam her maid always went to see her acquaintance who lived at the other end of the town and very often came home sadly out of temper because her place was not so fine and so fashionable as theirs and then i was sure to suffer for it as indeed i did for all her ill temper when she had nobody else to vent upon ah madame often of a sunday in the summer i have gone up into our dining-room because the street was so close and narrow that below we hardly saw day light from one end of the year to the other and i have opened the sash and looked against the black walls and shut windows of the houses opposite and have thought how dismal it was ah i remembered too well the beautiful green hills the meadows and woods where i so often used to ramble with my sister when we were children in our own country before we were old enough to know that my poor mother was unhappy and had learnt to weep with her how often i have wished those days would come again and how often i have shut my eyes and tried to fancy i saw once more all the dear objects that then were so charming alas the dream would not last long or if it did served only to make me feel more unhappy when instead of being able to indulge it i was obliged to go back to hard and what was yet worse to dirty work in our dismal kitchen in devonshire i had been used to work hard enough but i had always fresh air to breathe and could now and then of an evening sit at our cottage window and look at the moon and fancy that my mother might be there with my sister and that they saw and pitied the poor unfortunate jessie tears then relieved me and i gathered courage to bear the next day the ill-humour of my mother-in-law which now that it was over i fancied was not worse than the ill-humour of miss gillam my father's harshness indeed was worse than either because i loved him and every time he used to speak cruelly to me and seemed to wish me away it was like a dagger in my heart the tears of the unfortunate jessie here interrupted her narrative a moment and celestina took occasion to say but what were you going to tell me about mr cathcart you seem to have forgotten him ah oh, madame replied she with a deep sigh i thought after i began to talk of him that i was doing wrong and that it was better not to say any more about him besides madame though you are so good and so condescending it is not perhaps proper for me to trouble you with all the reasons i have to be sorrowful indeed i wish extremely to know them replied celestina and particularly i desire to know all that relates to mr cathcart the little you have said has interested me greatly it was on the sunday madame that i was speaking of when everybody was gone out that poor mr cathcart first spoke to me alone often before that to be sure i thought he pitied me when he saw me doing work too heavy for my strength and often he has offered to help me and did not disdain to assist me though the footman did and yet i am sure his look and his manners were a great deal more like those of a nobleman than anything else mrs gillam however was always so angry if she saw him speak to or help me and used to put herself into such passions that he was afraid almost of looking at me before her lest it should be the occasion of my being used ill on the sunday madame that i was speaking of he had finished all my master left for him to do between six and seven o'clock for he wrote such a beautiful hand and so quick that his writing seemed done by enchantment that day he had eat no dinner 
but a little after six o'clock he came down into the kitchen where i was fitting jessie said he will you make me some tea i am fatigued and i think it will refresh me ah madame how pleased i was to do anything for him as he sat on the other side of the table drinking his tea i looked at him and thought his eyes seemed inflamed as if he had been crying and he seemed more melancholy than usual what is the matter mr cathcart said i you have tired yourself too much yes answered he i have been writing a long time but i have finished my business so i never mind my headache he seemed desirous of turning the discourse and reaching across to the side of the table where i sat he took up a torn book which while i was sweeping the clerk's office the day before my master had thrown to me bidding me burn it for that he would not have such trumpery lay about there i never had time to read though my poor mother had taught me to love it and i had thrown this book into a drawer from whence i had taken it but a moment before mr cathcart came down he inquired how i came by it and when i told him asked if i had read it i answered that i had no time it is my book said he sighing from the bottom of his heart as he spoke and it is the story of a poor young man who was as unfortunate as i am but he had the resolution to end his calamities he indeed was not enchained to life as i must be heavens and earth exclaimed he as if at that moment oppressed by some idea altogether unsupportable how long shall i remain the wretch i am he started from his chair and walked about the room with looks so wild that i was terrified to death i went to him trembling and besought him to be calm to tell me if i could do anything for him he looked eagerly at me a moment and burst into tears ah jessie cried he you pity me and all the return i make is to terrify and distress you for a moment madame after this gust of passion he became calmer and sat down then as i stood trembling by him he took my hands within his and put them to his burning forehead and eyes but after a moment seeming to recollect himself he sighed and let them go and said i hardly know jessie what ailed me just now but i was so tired my spirits were so exhausted by having been so long at the desk employed in such a tedious kind of writing that when i looked at you when you seemed concerned for me i am so little used to meeting any any friendly looks here that your pity affected me so strangely i felt just then how terrible how very terrible my fate was and this proud rebellious heart subdued yet to my cruel destiny deprived me for a moment of my reason thank god replied i you are now easier indeed you did sadly frighten me tell me mr dear cathcart why did you talk so and why are you unhappy i will tell you jessie answered he though you are the only person in the house who shall ever guess at my real situation I am unhappy, not because I was born and educated a gentleman, and am now reduced to a condition worse than absolute servitude, because those I love and feel for more than for myself are fallen with me, because my labor, and yet I am sacrificing my life to follow it, my labor is insufficient to support a woman, delicately brought up, and her four infant children ah oh, madame all the sorrow i have ever known was nothing to the cold death-like feeling which seemed to wither up my heart when for the moment i thought mr cathcart was married and had a family i did not know at the time why it hurt me so but i was not able to speak 
while he, after remaining silent a minute, said, By my work to-day I have earned a guinea more than my weekly stipend. Surely, therefore, instead of murmuring thus, I ought rather to be thankful that I have had power to do this, for to-morrow I shall receive it, and to-morrow I shall be able to carry to my Sophie and her children some necessaries which they have long wanted, but which I could not before spare money enough to procure for them, out of what I earn weekly as the only support of us all. Poor as I am, madame, I could not help unlocking my tea-chest, where I kept my little savings, and though I trembled like a leaf as I did it, I put a guinea and some silver, all I had, into a paper, and carried it to him. Mr. Cathcart, said I, pray be not offended, but take this trifle, and make use of it for your family. They want it more than I do, and you cannot think how much happier it will make me if you have it than if I lay it out on myself. Gracious God, cried he, this is too much. No, my dear, generous girl, do not imagine I will take what you have so hardly acquired. Believe me, Jessie, this instance of sensibility and kindness, charming as they are, only render me more wretched. In the meanest servitude, in the lowest degradation, amid the hardest labor, I have found a soul so much superior to those I have met in polished society, but your form, your manners, your sentiments, are not those of your station. Surely you were not born what I now see you. Indeed, replied I, I was, my father is now a laborer. I have no mother, nor any friend willing, if they are able, to do anything for me. But while I am able to work, I must not, I will not be discontented. Whatever hardships I may undergo, if you, Mr. Cathcart, will but lend me you be your friend, let me see your children. Indeed, I shall love them, and if your lady will give me leave, I will work for them. I can bring anything she will give me to do home, and work in my own room instead of going to bed. I do not know, madame, how I will be able to say so much, for I felt my heart throb as if it would break all the time I was speaking. Oh, madame, I was suddenly transported as if were to heaven, when Mr. Cathcart, thanking me, a thousand times for my offer, told me that the children he supported were not his own but his sister's, whose husband had been undone by the villainy of some people with whom he had been connected in trade, and by the wickedness of an attorney it is impossible to describe how I was relieved to find he was not married, for though I am sure I could have loved his children dearly because they were his, yet methought I loved them much better now. Sensations she had herself felt in regard to Willoughby now forcibly occurred to Celestina. She remained silent, however, and Jessie went on. At this time, madame, Mr. Cathcart took every opportunity of speaking to me, and I got leave to go out one evening, and he took me to see this beloved and unfortunate sister. It was one of those little new houses which are run up in a road leading from Iflington to London, that Mr. Cathcart's family lodged his sister, Madame, was so like him that the moment I saw her I could have died for her, and I forgot all the reluctance with which I had agreed at his earnest request to go see her. She seemed to be four or five years older than he is, and was very pale and thin, but she had such beautiful eyes and hands so white. Her form was so graceful, so commanding, that her very plain dress and a close cap, such as a widow's wear, could not disfigure her or make her look otherwise than like a gentlewoman. 
when her brother led me in she held out her hand to me and begged i would sit down though in such a poor little lodging i felt she was so much my superior that i could not obey her without hesitation but she presently by her gracious manners dissipated my fears and i sat down by her close to a frame on which she had been working a cradle with a sleeping baby in it stood at her feet by which a little girl of three years old sat as if watching the infant and on hassocks near the window were placed two little boys the elder not above six years old who were learning their tasks as soon as my reception was over she smiled on her brother with more cheerfulness than it seemed possible a moment before her countenance to assume and desired he would assist her in getting some tea for me cathcart went downstairs and then she entered into conversation with me my brother said she has often told me how unfit you are for the condition in which he found you and if i may judge by your appearance you certainly were not born to it had my dear frank been any other than he is i should have supposed him influenced by beauty but i know that mere personal loveliness in any rank never affected him and many reasons induced me jessie to consent to see you reasons which relate to him as well as yourself he has told you jessie that he was born to prospects very different from those now before him prospects which i fear vanished for ever my misfortunes which are such as i dare not attempt to relate to you have extended to him yet does he with unexampled generosity give himself up to servitude to assist me and my poor children judge whether such a brother is not dear to me judge whether i ought not to love all that he loves and to comply as far as possible with all his wishes i have of late seen with infinite pain that in addition to all the calamities of indigence a passion has seized him which must increase and may perpetrate his misfortunes and i consented and even wished to see you that i may fairly state to you the situation he is in as to circumstances in the hope a hope in which i trust i shall not be deceived that your good sense and even your regard for him will lead you to avoid an error so seducing that of becoming his wife i do not know madame how i looked at that moment but i believe mrs elphinstone thought i should faint for she gave me an immediate assistance by opening the window fetched me a glass of water and very earnestly entreated me to recover myself before her brother returned i should be too tedious madame were i to relate all that passed even in the few minutes we were together afterwards i found that cathcart's regard for me was such that he was willing to forget what he had once been and what he might still be and to unite himself for ever with the poor and humble jessie ah madame had it not been for mrs elphinstone's sake who with her children had no other dependence i should have feared no poverty no distress with him but should have been too happy to have begged round the world with him as it was i saw that i ought not to think a moment of marriage which would be at best only increase his difficulties oh how th i then wished that my grandfather was less cruel my poor father less imprudent after this first interview with mrs elphinstone i saw her whenever i could get leave to go out which was not indeed very often but my master who did not want humanity seeing me look dreadfully ill ordered mrs gillam to let me go out whenever she could spare me for air mrs elphinstone who watched every alteration of my countenance guessed 
at all i suffered and at length she became so fond of me that she rather desired that opposed the completion of her brother's wishes the struggle i underwent nearly cost me my life but at length madame i have left them both i could not bear to see my dear cathcart every day more and more unhappy i could not bear to become a burden to him for some time i redoubled my diligence and exerted myself greatly beyond my strength from a hope that by becoming necessary to my mistress i should obtain an increase of wages out of which i thought it possible that i might be able to save something but the upper servant took pains to render all my endeavours ineffectual and my health declined so rapidly under the labour and anxiety i endured that cathcart whose uneasiness completed the measure of my sufferings at length proposed that i should quit the, my service and that only means of saving my life and try what my native air would do to restore me i hope my father will receive me without unkindness and suffer me to stay till i am able to take another service and sometimes i am willing to flatter myself that my grandfather may relent though it is more possible than probable and where inquired celestina have you left your lover ah madame replied the weeping jessie he still remains writing for the existence of his sister and her children at his pen from early morning to eleven or twelve at night but such assiduous application he enabled indeed to earn double the money he would otherwise do but his dear health is fast declining and god only knows continued she clasping her hands together whether i shall ever see him more but if not one comfort one great comfort is that we shall not be separated long in heaven nothing can part us let us however hope said celestina that your tenderness your fortitude and generosity will be rewarded on earth your father then knows nothing of your arrival ah no madame i dare not write him for fear he should have been angry with me for having quitted my service and have refused to receive me now i hope when he sees me so sadly altered for i am not at all like i was when i left him he will have some pity upon me and suffer me at least to stay in his house till i have strength enough to undertake another service you shall go with me however to-night said celestina and you shall stay with me till you are fitter than you now appear to be to undergo an interview with this cruel father the poor jessie oppressed by this goodness could not speak but she kissed the hand of her benefactress with a respectable gratitude and a mournful but not unpleasing sadness kept the generous and soft-hearted celestina silent till their arrival at the inn where they were to remain that night end of volume one chapter nine recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c